On Tuesday, July 13th, 2004, a violent F4 twister tore through the community of Roanoke, Illinois. An event that sets itself apart as one of the most unique I've talked about on this channel. But not for a reason you might expect. We've talked extensively on this channel about the impacts tornadoes can have to life and property, particularly when caught off guard or not sheltered. But the story of Roanoke defies expectation. What could have been a catastrophe beyond imagination instead became a story nothing short of incredible. This is the extraordinary story of the Roanoke, Illinois tornado. Roanoke, Illinois is a small community just outside of the Peoria metropolitan area nestled in central Illinois. The village of Roanoke, like many other population centers in central Illinois, would begin through the popularity of coal mining in the 19th century. By the 21st century and in 2004, the community maintained a population just over 1,900 residents, a majority of which worked in agriculture, producing corn and soybeans. Roanoke had always been a small, tight-knit community where not much happened. That is, until Tuesday, July 13th, 2004. The 2004 tornado season was particularly intense, with multiple violent twisters across different states, including the likes of the Halam, Nebraska twister, which is still the second widest tornado in recorded history. Tornadoes in July are not uncommon. Northern Illinois is considered somewhat of a hotspot for an elevated tornado risk during this time of year, along with several other states in the Midwest. With all the extra heat in the air, these kinds of events usually have extreme amounts of cape or potential energy for storms to feed off of, which makes for a highly unstable atmosphere and explosive storms which is exactly what was about to happen in the second week of July in 2004 as a low pressure system progressed eastward, ultimately causing a multiple day severe weather outbreak across the central and eastern portions of the US. Along with the system, a prominent mid-level jet and Cape values forecasted to be over 4,000 joules per kilogram, the elements were really coming together for a classic July severe weather setup. In light of this increasingly volatile setup, by Tuesday, July 13th, the day of the Roanoke tornado, the SPC issues a moderate risk of severe weather with a 15% tornado risk. And not only was there the threat for tornadoes, but very large hail and even the mention of a derecho wind event later in the evening. By 7 a.m., moisture is already saturating the atmosphere with dew points in the 70s and Cape quickly rising well over 3,000 joules per kilogram. Shortly after, a severe thunderstorm watch was issued for Northern Illinois, along with a highlighted area of tornadic potential in the short term. Storms that had already began to form earlier in the afternoon are now entering the primed area of the atmosphere, and the event is officially underway. By 2 p.m. in this highly unstable atmosphere, one of the supercells that had already formed earlier in the northernmost corner of Illinois was progressing south, southeast. The Storm Prediction Center quickly issues a severe thunderstorm warning for this storm. With the help of the 30 to 40 knot wind shear present, the rotation was only continuing to increase and the Roanoke tornado was very quickly forming. By 2.34 p.m. in the same minute that the tornado warning is issued by the National Weather Service, the Roanoke tornado has fully formed and touches down in Woodford County. By 2.36 p.m., just two minutes after the tornado warning is issued, Steve Smedley has already captured an image of the tornado in its first stages of life, already fully condensed and incredibly ominous. 
The Twister begins its first stretch of damage across Illinois Route 89 and County Road 1600 North, here at F0 to F1 intensity. It's in rural landscape. By 2.37 p.m., the tornado is already quite menacing and looming over several structures south and west of Roanoke. At this point, several storm spotters have been recording the storm and alerting residents of the impending danger headed towards them. In the next few minutes, the storm would strengthen to F2 intensity as it takes a brief turn eastward over County Road 1130 East for half a mile before turning south again. It's behaving quite erratically. And despite the fact that the storm hasn't hit any major structures as it's moved through the rural landscape of Woodford County, that was about to change in a big way. The tornado is now approaching the southern end of the town of Roanoke, where the Parsons Company manufacturing plant resided. The Parsons plant, originally built in 1971, makes a variety of large parts for companies like Caterpillar. And on July 13th, 2004, the company had 140 plus employees inside the building. The increasingly violent tornado is about to bear down on the plant within mere minutes. Get the heck out of the way. But here's where the story of Roanoke separates itself from what should have really been a tragic one. By the time the Twister has reached the proximity of the Parsons plant, in just those few short minutes, thanks to the storm spotters relaying information to the Parsons plant and the fact that they had a NOAA weather radio, the Parsons team had already activated their emergency plan. In the final moments before the plant takes a direct hit, the emergency manager takes one final look outside at the massive funnel before taking shelter. The twister increases to F4 intensity and makes a direct path through Parsons Manufacturing. That is huge. Look, yeah, look at that debris. That's all debris right there. is flying everywhere and it's it's destroyed tiny pieces one of the employees would later recall the feeling of being pulled and dragged on the ground as if they were all going to be sucked out of the building vehicles are thrown into the plant steel beams and metal siding all of the things that are inside a large manufacturing plant are being tossed around and launched like missiles some of which would ultimately be found three quarters of a mile away from the original plant location after hitting the plant directly the roanoke twister continues on its path eastward at f3 intensity where it's about to brush across four farmsteads located one mile east of the plant. Throughout this entire process, those two local chasers are still on top of this storm, recording every moment. The twister approaches the four farmsteads with all of the debris of the plant now inside of it. Oh, wow, I, this is so unreal. I'm so close to it. There's more debris. Oh my goodness. It's perfectly clear and that thing's coming. It's going right at this house over here. I hope we don't get hit by it. I'm gonna go get behind it so it doesn't come. That's gonna hit the church. Please don't let that happen.
Thankfully, because Roanoke was a very tight-knit community, those who lived in the farmsteads were called in advance and warned of the storm as it moved towards them. The Wilbur family, Dan and Amy, were one of the families in that path. Without much time to think, they decide that the best plan of action is to get in their car and try to get out of the storm's path. That was until they actually get in their car and see the tornado for the first time in the rearview mirror. The tornado was right on top of them and their newborn baby, which was with them at the time. And of course, this is a seemingly impossible decision to make. Do you take your chances to drive away from the storm or do you take your chances riding it out in your home? Ultimately, Dan and Amy Wilbur and their newborn baby decided to run to the neighbor's house. The two families huddled together in the basement while the tornado, in their own words, disintegrated the house on top of them. The twister bore down on two farmsteads here in its path, which were completely blown away with only the basements remaining. Just after 2.45 p.m., the Roanoke tornado has moved through roughly eight miles of largely rural landscape in its short life. Now it's about to cause its final bit of damage over County Roads 1300 North and 1700 East. It's breaking up. It's breaking up. I think it's getting smaller. In its last breath of life, the tornado causes significant damage to two final homes in its path before curving sharply to the southeast. And finally, at 2.54 p.m., just 20 minutes after its conception, the Roanoke Twister dies off. Swimming Johnny Wiggins. Destruction. Something's house standing here. We probably get damaged. Here's another look. Some of the wind damage. It's pretty obvious here, but the tornado went through. Wow. Part of the tornado right through here. There's two different varieties of corn planted at an angle. I don't think so. In total, the Roanoke tornado had a path length of 9.6 miles and averaged around 440 yards in width, up to a quarter mile in width at its peak. And although the Roanoke tornado was certainly the main event in regards to tornadoes, the thunderstorms ultimately would go on to form an intense squall line that resulted in a derecho event across the Ohio Valley in the evening and overnight hours. In the immediate aftermath of the Roanoke tornado, although it was evident that not many structures were hit, the Parsons manufacturing plant was a wreck. Looking at the damage to the plant, I can completely understand how someone on the outside might assume that not everybody made it out of that building safely, and those people would be completely wrong. The most shocking and incredible part of the story of Roanoke was that despite this twister's violence and intensity, particularly over the Parsons plant, there was not a single fatality or a single serious injury. Minutes after the violent storm had struck the plant, employees began taking a headcount of each person as they came out. Looking at the level of damage, they were pretty certain that not everybody was going to have come out. But to everyone's surprise, by the end of the headcount, not only were all 140 plus employees accounted for, they were all fine. Every single one of them came out without injury. And while this might seem like a stroke of luck or some kind of miracle, it wasn't. This was, by all means, the direct result of preparation and implementation of safety protocols by Parsons Manufacturing. So let's talk a little bit about what happened at Parsons and how it was and is attainable. To understand what happened at Parsons Manufacturing, we have to take a look at its history from the founder, Bob Parsons. 
Owner Bob Parsons had previously experienced a damaging tornado firsthand. His experience with this storm showed him just how devastating tornadoes can be, so when he founded the Parsons Manufacturing Facility, he was adamant that it be prepared for a tornado. When the original facility was erected, included in the design were three separate concrete and rebar reinforced restrooms, which made viable storm shelters strong enough to withstand even a violent tornado. And not only that, Parsons ensured that even though there were no federal regulations that required companies to include tornado drills, Parsons Manufacturing participated in several timed tornado drills and exercises every year. So on July 13th, 2004, Parsons Manufacturing and its employees were more than ready to implement the drills that they had been practicing for years. And they did so perfectly. Here's a timeline. At 2.30 p.m., one minute after the severe thunderstorm warning was issued, the team was already starting to implement their severe weather plan, which included having trained spotters on the job confirm the storm from their location as it was beginning to form a tornado. Actually, the weather ban had went off and it said a severe thunderstorm warning for the Roanoke area. And at that time, Laura was looking out another window and that's when she saw I guess the tail of it. Everybody is about 150 people, all who've experienced regular tornado drills, one even recently, and all who survived unscathed. One minute later at 2.34 p.m., the same minute that the tornado warning was issued, management had already announced over PA for everyone to get into their shelters. And that's really important because without these trained spotters and without the NOAA weather radio that they had, inside the facility, the employees likely would have never heard a tornado siren outside. And in 2004, there were no tornado warnings on cell phones. It was very loud. It was like a, having your head stuck in a sweet, street sweeper. You know, it, it was just a sweeping sound and the pressure changes your ears. You can feel it in your ears. And when I was standing there, it was like I could feel it passing over by, you know, just because I felt so insignificant, so small, you know, it's, it's, it's a humbling feeling. By 2.38 p.m., just four minutes after they announced on the PA for everyone to get into shelter, all 140 plus employees were in one of the three storm shelters and the manager was doing their final sweep to ensure employees were in the shelters before the tornado hit. This was a direct result of the fact that they not only had tornado drills, the employees were more than familiar with the emergency protocol, they knew exactly where to go, and they practiced it every year. We had three different shelters and it was different for all of us. Um, and I don't know if it's because, like, I heard we were in the eye of it from what some people were telling us, my shelter that I was in. And um, if, if that, you know, makes the experience different, I'm sure it does. Um, and that was what was incredible too, because it was almost as if we were all in different storms. And this is something that's been studied a lot in social science and included in multiple case studies on different fatal tornado events. When you physically practice your plan of action, when you go to your tornado safety spot, when you know where it's at, when you have things prepared, you are a lot more likely to perform that action well and under stress when you've done it before physically in the event that you maybe only have a few seconds or a minute to actually get into shelter when you start to panic. I found a great presentation on this event and the safety implementations done by the Lincoln, Illinois National Weather Service office. So I'll have that linked below if you want to see a full breakdown on the preparation and implementation of safety done by the Parsons plant. In total, there were no fatalities, no serious or critical injuries. There were 10 minor injuries. One of those minor injuries was a cut on the head of one of the mothers who rode out the storm in the basement in the farmstead. Heads bleed a lot. She required six stitches, but made a full recovery. Outside of those 10 minor injuries, nothing else. Which is almost unheard of for a violent tornado to not only cause no fatalities, but no major injuries. It's just not something you hear of very often. 
And I do want to express though that while the story of Roanoke is incredible, I do want to stress that there are times where even when you take every precaution that you can, you are doing everything right. There are times that freak accidents happen. There are times in which the tornado is just so violent. There's really not much you can do, even if you're underground. There unfortunately are times that even if you do everything right, bad things still happen. The survey of the Roanoke, Illinois Twister was conducted on July 14th and 15th by the local National Weather Service offices. Of course, it was rated using the old Fujita scale, which wasn't implemented until 2007 or 8. The National Weather Service ultimately rated this Twister in F4, with notes that winds likely exceeded 200 miles per hour over the plant. The survey also found the average width of the tornado to be just over 400 yards, including in the area where it hit the farmsteads, which meant that the farmsteads, which were completely destroyed, actually were not even in the center of the tornado's circulation, rather about 100 yards outside of it, and they were still flattened. Now he's walked through the ruin from that day. The day he says he wasn't scared, but he along with so many others thought their lives were over. In the recovery process, it looked a lot different from the average one we talked about because the devastation was really confound to a small area and there weren't that many structures overall that were hit. There also weren't any fatalities, so that takes away a lot of the conversations that we normally have. After the tornado, the town was out of power for roughly three days. Of the individuals who lost their homes, there were six farmsteads in total. Like we mentioned, this was largely an agricultural area where people owned farmsteads and barns and multiple acres. Of those who lost their homes, they would ultimately rebuild either in the exact same area or very close to where their original home was once built on the same plot of land. The chasers who caught the video of the Roanoke tornado on camera eventually produced and sold that footage in Peoria in order to raise funds for the Parsons plant employees and for the citizens of Roanoke who largely lost their cars, most of which were either underinsured on their cars or completely uninsured, leaving them without a reliable mode of transportation for their daily lives. Today is his first walk through the ruins after that day. A day he says he wasn't scared, but he was sure he was going to meet his maker. It's one of those eerie feelings when you walk through there. Immediately after the Parsons manufacturing plant was destroyed, they were given an award from the Illinois Emergency Management Agency for their successful emergency planning and implementation. Very shortly after, the Parsons plant would begin to be rebuilt on the same plot of land and opened again not even a year after the tornado in April of 2005. And the best part of this story is that the Parsons plant, the new one reopened with seven tornado shelters, which is four more than they originally had. I would really hug those people if I could. That is amazing. They really continue to go above and beyond for the employees and that's really evident. We're fortunate enough that uh, we could see the storm coming. If, if it was at night uh, and thank God it wasn't, it, it could have been a different story. And most of them are happy to help with cleanup. I'm still bringing a paycheck home. Got a wife and two kids at home, so I got to do something. You know, I can't, the unemployment line ain't going to pay the bills for them. We all are assigned jobs. Okay. And it, that'll change day by day or what needs to be done. Owner Bob Parsons says workers will be receiving a paycheck and full benefits for 8 to 12 months. When the site and surrounding fields are cleared of debris, qualified workers will then help with construction of the new plant. Incredibly, the Parsons plant itself actually had another close encounter with a tornado in November of 2013 when a twister moved through Washington, Illinois, just sparing the town of Roanoke. Fortunately, they didn't have to go through that process again, but I have a feeling that even if it did, 
the Parsons plant would have been more than ready. The story of the Roanoke, Illinois tornado is so important because it emphasizes to us why there are so many safety measures in place and why they can and do make a difference. It's also a story that gives us hope as individuals and employees that there are measures that can be taken to protect us during these storms. It doesn't have to be a miracle that people survive tornadoes. It's a very real and very attainable goal to prevent more storm-related fatalities by being educated on what to do should it come in your direction. To me, talking about the Roanoke tornado only reignites my frustration about the Mayfield event, bringing again to question why there were so many workplace fatalities when there was over an hour of a warning for a lot of these places. There was just absolutely no excuse as to why there were people on the other side of a building when there was an hour of a tornado warning and not everybody was in a shelter and managers weren't able to come up with answers for people and people lost their lives. A lot of people lost their lives. And it's so frustrating to me that not only are all of these things happening on a smaller scale, but even on a larger scale, tornado drills still aren't required for workplaces which is a little mind boggling to me. OSHA also doesn't require any kind of reinforcement for the shelters that would make even just a bathroom, for example, a viable storm shelter for a strong or violent tornado. And like the Parsons Manufacturing Company, we can see that even just adding some extra concrete and rebar can reinforce a bathroom, particularly for manufacturing plants that often use tilt-up construction, which are notoriously susceptible to wind and tornado damage. The lack of a complete disaster that happened in Roanoke, Illinois was all completely thanks to the people who prepared for an event just like this one. Ultimately, the resilience and preparation of the people of Roanoke was what really made this story stand out as one of the most unique that I've ever talked about on this channel. Anyways, that's all I have for today's video, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. If you want to support me or the video, if you liked it, make sure you're subscribed and you can like the video down below. You can comment and let me know what you think. Um, follow me on social media if you want to see more of me by any chance. Yeah, that's it. Thank you all so much for being here and I will see you all in the next one. Bye. The twister. The blister. Oh my God, can I talk? I can't even read. Why did I write so much? Although there were no fegu- <laughs> Feg did move to the south of the t titty. Mm. <laughs> and not- <laughs>